Peace be upon you. If you could have any superpower, which superpower would you choose to have and what would be the motivation for selecting that superpower over any other power? For instance, would you want to be like Superman where you can fly, be faster than a speeding bullet? Or maybe you don't want to fly. You want to be more like Nightcrawler where instantaneously you can teleport anywhere in the world. Or maybe you want to increase your intelligence to be the smartest human being on this planet, to be like Professor Xavier, to be able to read people's thoughts or to be able to talk with them telepathically, or move things with your mind. Or maybe you want to be like Wolverine, to have a super advanced immune system, where you'd heal instantaneously, where you'd barely age, where uh, you would never get sick or have any disease. So as you're thinking through which superpower you'd want, I want you to think, what is the motivation? When you were thinking about flying, were you thinking that, oh, that'd be great, never have to go on the t- deal with the TSA, never have to worry about missing a flight, Uh, or making a connection, or any of that nonsense, or you don't even have to commute to work, you just fly anywhere you want to go. Or maybe you were thinking that, hey, if I had super strength, I could be the world's greatest athlete. You know, teams would pay me millions of dollars to, uh, to, to play for them. And um, I would have, you know, kids would have my poster up on their wall, and they would name shoes after me, or uh, I could go to the Olympics and win a gold medal. Or maybe you thought, hey, if I was the smartest human being on this uh, planet, I could use that skill towards the uh, stock market, and I can make incredible amounts of wealth. I can be wealthier than uh, Warren Buffett. Which, which superpower did you choose, and what was the motivation? Now ask yourself, were the motivations you were considering at the benefit of yourself, or were you thinking what superpowers and how it could benefit others? Because if you were thinking about how these superpowers could benefit only yourself, you were thinking in the mindset of a supervillain and not a superhero. You see, the difference between a superhero and a supervillain is a superhero uses the powers given to them in order to benefit others, while a supervillain uses those powers only to benefit themselves. Now, it might be a shock to realize that we have tendencies that are more akin to a supervillain than a superhero, but don't let that stop you. Let it correct your actions, because in the story of Spider-Man, what we see is that Spider-Man was bitten by a radioactive spider, and the first thing he did was he went and made a lot of money wrestling. And one day when a uh, robber walked past him and he didn't do anything, the cop asked him why, he said, it's not my responsibility. But when that same robber killed his uncle, he realized that he had that responsibility. Now you're thinking, well, I'm not a superhero. What's this have to do with me? Every single one of us have God-given abilities that God has given us, provisions, be it a skill set, be it something that we can offer other people. But if we're only thinking how this can benefit us, we're thinking of the mindset of a supervillain and not a superhero. In Surah 2 verse 3, God tells us the criteria of the believer. It says, who believe in the unseen and from uh, observe the contact prayers and from our provisions to them, they give to charity. Everything you've received in this life is a loan from God. There is nothing you're going to take in this world to the hereafter. Everything you possess is going to be inherited by future generations. And how are you using these blessings that God has given you? And you're thinking that, you know, maybe you don't have the money, the status, this and that. There is nothing that some, no little amount that someone has that they can't provide value for someone else. And we see this in one of the real life superheroes of the Quran, of Moses. You know, Moses was given status. He was given strength. He was given character. He was given all these blessings. And we see how he uses it for the benefit of other people. When he had everything and when he had nothing. In Surah 28 verse 15 we read, Once he entered the city unexpectedly without being recognized by the people, he found two men fighting. One was a Hebrew from his people and the other was an Egyptian from his enemies. The one from his people said, called on him for help against the enemy. Moses punched him, killing him. He said, this is the work of the devil. He is a real enemy and a profound misleader. Now, Moses could have said, look, I want nothing to do with this. I have too much on the line. I have too much status. I don't want to give that up, getting involved in your skirmishes. But he saw someone was being victimized. Someone was being oppressed and called on him for help. And he responded. Now, unfortunately, he accidentally killed a person. And we see how he responds in 2816 where he reads, He said, My Lord, I have wronged my soul. Please forgive me. He forgave him. He is the forgiver most merciful. He said, My Lord, in return for your blessings upon me, I will never be a supporter of the guilty ones. 
He made this vow to God that he would never support the guilty ones, that he will stand on the side of justice, that he will stand on the side of those who are victimized and oppressed. And it continues in 28.18, it says, In the morning he was in the city afraid and watchful. The one who sought his help yesterday asked for his help again. Moses said to him, You're really a troublemaker. Now you would think at this point Moses would want nothing to do with him. He saw how it turned out yesterday. Bad news. Same guy asking for help again. And how does Moses respond? You know, Moses intervenes in 28.19, says, Before he attempted to strike their common enemy, he said, Oh, Moses, do you want to kill me as you killed the other man yesterday? Obviously, you wish to be a tyrant on earth. You do not wish to be righteous. That despite what happened yesterday, that Moses still continued to stand up for the oppressed. He still continued to fight those who are doing the oppressing. And he put everything on the line in order to stand up for justice. And it continues in 2020, says, A man came from the, running from the other side of the city saying, Oh, Moses, the people are plotting to kill you. You better leave immediately. I am giving you good advice. He fled the city afraid and watchful. He said, My Lord, save me from the oppressive people. That Moses was willing to give everything up, his status, his home, his family, everything he had, he was willing to put aside in order to be able to help other people. This is the sign of a hero. Now, he did this when he had everything. What does he do now that he has nothing? He has no home, he has no food, no shelter, no water, no nothing. And we see in 28.22, it says, As he traveled towards Midian, he said, May my Lord guide me in the right path. When he reached Midian's water, he found the crowd of people watering. And notice two women watering on the side. He said, What is it that you need? So here he is, hungry, thirsty, no home, no security. And he has strength. What he could have done is push the people aside and got water for himself. But he noticed that there was two people who needed his help. They needed something that he could provide them. And it continues, they said, we are not able to water until the crowd disperses and our father is an old man. He watered for them, then turned to the shade saying, my Lord, whatever provision you send to me, I'm in dire need for it. That Moses, despite having nothing, was able to provide value to someone else, to be able to help someone else. And then he turned to God and asked God for help in return. That he never thought that he was a victim in this. He never thought that he had nothing to offer. That despite his circumstances, when he had everything and he had nothing, his focus was still how can he help other people. Now there's a real life example also from World War II of another superhero. This person, he was living in England. His name is Nicholas Winton. And he was on a two-week holiday in Switzerland skiing. And he heard about what was going on in Czechoslovakia as the Germans invaded and people were being dis, uh, dispelled from their home. They had to li live in refugee camps, in tents, in the winter of Czechoslovakia. So he took time out of his vacation and he went down to see what was going on. And he saw 150,000 people, families, who were just living in tents in the, 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 the winter, barely surviving, and it broke his heart. And he wanted to know what he could do to help these people, specifically these children. So he went back to uh, England, and this is in 1938, and he petitioned the British government to allow these children to migrate to England. And the, the uh, British government uh, accepted it with one contingency that he finds families to adopt them. And he, what he did next was he created advertisements uh, of these children and he sent it all over begging families to adopt these children. He sent letters to other heads of state and no one else uh, accepted these uh, children. They said there's nothing we can do for them. But he gave everything he had in order to be able to help and save these children. And who was he? He was in his barely, uh, in his late 20s. He was a stockbroker. He had no background in humanitarian efforts, in migration, in anything, but he saw an opportunity and he seized it. He did what he can in order to help it, and he saved 669 children from certain death. Needless to say, those families who stayed in Czechoslovakia uh, when the Germans invaded Prague, most of them were sent to concentration camps and most of them were uh, exterminated. But he was able to save these people. And for 50 years, he didn't talk about what he did. Even the children who were saved from his efforts knew, had no clue he was behind their rescue. And in 1988, the BBC heard about his courageous act and they uh, invited him to an event so he could talk about it. 
And they asked the people in the audience if they would stand, if they were one of the children who were saved by Nicholas Winton. And when he turned around, he saw the entire auditorium was standing. These were all the people that he saved. And these people, they grew to have their own families. They grew to have their own kids and their own grandkids, all because of this one man's courageous act. Again, he had no background in this. He was a stockbroker. He was in his late 20s, but he saw this opportunity. And unlike the millions of people who were passive, who did nothing, he did something different. Now, we, th- we thrive. We, we wish to be one of these people. We wish to be able to do such righteous works. And we have to ask ourselves, are we this joyous when these opportunities come to us? Or do we frown? Do we turn away? Do we get discouraged when we hear of these opportunities? In 59.9, it says, As for those who provided them with a home and a refuge and were believers before them, they love those who immigrated to them and find no hesitation in their hearts in helping them. In fact, they readily give them priority over themselves, even when they themselves need what they give away. Indeed, those who overcome their natural stinginess are the successful ones. Now, you might say, well, I don't have money. I don't have connections. How am I supposed to help? But there's, are we ever so stingy as to just say hello to someone, to smile? And you think, what does that possibly have to do? I was listening to an interview. It was someone who survived an attempted suicide by jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge. And he made a vow. He said, if one person was to just ask me, how am I doing? You know, what is my pain? How can they help? That he would have stopped his attempted suicide. That he would have not have jumped. But he said in his entire walk, not one person asked, not one person inquired. He was reading a letter of someone else who did jump, who didn't survive. And he made a similar vow. He says, if one person, just one person smiles as I'm walking to commit suicide, that's enough for me to not do the act. And not a single person smiled out of the hundreds of people he potentially walked by. So ask yourself, is there ever, are we ever in a position where we don't have something to offer someone else? Something as simple as a smile. How are you? How are things? Is there anything I can do to help you? What is it that you need? And see what it is that we can do for other people. Because if we're only thinking about ourselves, what we can do to benefit ourselves, and we forget about what it is we can do to benefit other people, then we're living the life of a supervillain and not a superhero. In Surah 57 verse 11, it says, Who would loan God a loan of righteousness to have it multiplied for him manifold and end up with the generous recompense. We should be so ecstatic at any opportunity to be able to help and do kind things and good things for other people. This is a trait of what we uh, we strive to be. Now ask yourself this, if someone came to you and said, hey, I have an opportunity for you to make a lot of money, would that make you more excited than someone said, hey, I have an opportunity for you to give to charity? Which one is the one that you get excited about? Is it to make money or to give to charity? Is it in order to benefit yourself or to benefit others? Now we have to recondition ourselves to get our priorities straight. Because if we think of only of the things of this world, in this life, we're only going to be setting ourselves up for disaster. We'll be living the life of a super villain. Now if we think, what is it that I can do to benefit, to help other people? We're living the life of a superhero. That's what makes a superhero so inspirational, so courageous, that they're willing to put their needs aside, to use the skill sets that they have to help other people, to benefit other people. In Surah 38, verse 32, we read about Solomon. Solomon, who was blessed with so such vast material wealth, but one day he got distracted by specifically his horses that he forgot about God. And he made this comment in 38, 32, where it reads, He then said, I enjoyed the material things more than I enjoyed worshiping my Lord until the sun was gone. And we have to ask ourselves, do we enjoy worshiping God, drawing closer to God, doing righteous things, helping others more than we enjoy the materials, the vanities of this world? Because that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to be ecstatic when we see the opportunity to help someone, to feed someone, to do a nice thing, to smile, to say hello, to see how people are doing. How can we help others? We see the example of the opposite of the ultimate supervillain of Karun. In 2876, it reads, Karun, the slave driver, was one of Moses' people who betrayed them and oppressed them. We gave him so many treasures that the keys thereof were almost too heavy for the strongest band. His people said to him, Do not be so arrogant. God does not love those who are arrogant. 
Here's someone that God blessed with immense wealth, and he used this wealth only to oppress and to enrich himself further. It continues in 2877, it says, Use the provisions bestowed upon you by God to seek the abode of the hereafter without neglecting your share in this world. Be charitable as God has been charitable towards you. Do not keep on corrupting the earth. God does not love the corruptors. There's so many lessons from this verse. For one, God is telling us, use the provisions bestowed upon you uh, by God to seek the abode of the hereafter. That what we get on loan from God, all the blessings we have, be it our money, our status, our connections, the language we know, the skill sets we have, the connections we have, the friends we have, how are we using this? Are we using it only to benefit ourselves? Or are we using this to grow in righteous deeds, to draw closer to God? God is telling us in this verse that it's our duty to be charitable, but we're not supposed to give away everything, right? We keep what we need, but with the excess, we use that to help other people, right? We each have responsibilities. We have responsibilities to ourselves, to our families, to our loved ones, to our friends, and we can't absolve ourselves of those responsibilities. But anything that's excess, we have to realize that this is for other people. This is for us to help other people. Now, one of the things I love, they say, how do you know you're giving enough? Because God tells us in the Quran that we should give the excess. And the quote I heard is that you give enough where you feel uncomfortable. That's when you know you're giving enough. If you don't feel uncomfortable with how much you're giving, how much time, money, uh, attention you're giving to other people, then it means that we need to do more. Everything we have is because of God. God has lent this to us to see how we use these provisions in this world. Uh, to seek the hereafter. And any ounce of good we do, God is going to reward us manifold in this life and in the hereafter. God tells us in 2.195, says, You shall spend in the cause of God. Do not throw yourselves with your own hands into destruction. You shall be charitable. God loves the charitable. That we give enough where it makes us uncomfortable because that's where we're going to find growth. And it continues about Karun in 28.78. It says, He said, I attain all this because of my own cleverness. Did he not realize that God had annihilated before him generations that were much stronger than he and greater in number? The annihilated transgressors were not asked about their crimes. Now, Karun is thinking that he obtained this because he's so clever, he's so bright, he's so smart, and he doesn't realize God's system, that God gave this to him to test him, and he's utterly failing. And now all these blessings he have is going to be for his own destruction. Everything we have in this world is because of God's blessings. In Surah 56, 57, God gives us so many examples of showing us that the root of it is God. It says, we, create, we have created you if you could only believe. Have you noted the semen you produce? Did you create it or did we? God is telling us we have a child. We think we created that child. God created that child. God blessed us with that child. In 5660, it continues, we have predetermined death for you. Nothing can stop us from substituting new generations in your place and establishing what you do not know. You know about the first creation. Do you not remember? God controls life and death. God allowed us to live this life and has determined when we're going to end this life. This is all a blessing from God to think that I am alive because of my cleverness, because I'm so smart, because I do all these healthy things, is not giving credit where it's due. God is allowing us to live in order to obtain righteousness. It continues in 56.63. It says, Have you noted the crops you reap? Did you grow them or did we? If we will, we can turn it into hay. Then you will lament we lost, we are deprived. Who causes the, the seed to germinate? Who causes the system of a, this dead wood you put in the ground and you add a little bit of uh, water, um, some nitrogen, some sun, and then you get you know fruits and vegetables? Did we do that? No. We think because, oh, we rolled up our sleeves, we planted the seed, we tended to it, we caused the crops to grow. God is the one who caused the crops to grow. God is the one who gives us these provisions. If we think we're so clever because we did it, we're gr grossly uh, mistaken. It continues in 56, 68. It says, Have you noted the water you drink? Did you send it down from the clouds or did we? If we will, we can make it salty. You should be thankful. You think, you know, today we turn on the faucet and we have fresh water. We think, oh, we got this because I paid my water bill. And we don't realize this is part of God's system. You know, the, the aquifers, the wells that this water comes from, if that water was salty, we would not be able to drink it. 
It's God's system that he purifies this for us. He gives this to us to see who's appreciative and who's not. And it continues in 5671 says, have you noted the, the fire you ignite? Did you initiate its tree or did we? We rendered it a reminder and a useful tool for the users. You shall glorify the name of your Lord, the great. You know, we start fire energy. Where do you think this energy comes from? We think because we started the fire that the fire came from our doing. No, God initiated its tree, created it in order for us to be able to produce this energy, in order for us to be able to be thankful and appreciative of God. So when Karun says, I attain all this because of my own cleverness, he's grossly mistaken. And it continues in 2879, says, One day he came out to his people in full splendor. Those who preferred this worldly life said, Oh, we wish that we possess what Karun has attained. Indeed, he is very fortunate. 2880, as for those who were blessed with knowledge, they said, Woe to you! God's recompense is far better for those who believe and lead a righteous life. None attains this except the steadfast. We then caused the earth to swallow him and his mansion. No army could have helped him against God. He was not destined to be a winner. Those who were envious of him the day before said, Now we realize that God is the one who provides whomever he chooses from among his servants and withholds. If it were not for God's grace towards us, he could have caused the earth to swallow us too. We now realize that the disbelievers never succeed. God has put us on this planet for a temporary period to see how do we react? How do we behave? What value is it that we try to provide other people? What are we doing to grow in righteousness? If we're only focusing on ourselves, we think that we got all this because of our cleverness, because we're so uh, smart, we're so you know gifted. We're forgetting that the source of this is God. And there's going to be a day when it's all going to be taken away from us. And the only thing that's going to matter is how did we use these resources, these provisions, these blessings in order to obtain God's approval. Now, if you have any question about the fact that what matters at the end of the day, once we pass, is only our righteousness, read a eulogy from anyone who recently passed. And all you see is the good deeds this person has done. You know, they don't care what kind of car they drove. They don't care what kind of, you know, uh, job title they had. They look at the good deeds. How, what did this person do to benefit other people? Because that's the only thing that counts in the hereafter. You know, Karun was selfish. The only thing about himself, how his blessings could benefit himself and expense of others. He was vain. He exalted himself. He boasted about his provisions. And it's because of this that he was living the life of a supervillain. Now, let's not make the same mistake. I want to look at one other example of a person. She's in India. Her name is Sindhutai Subkal. And Sindhutai, at the age of, I believe, around 10 or 14, she was given off to be married to someone that she thought was in his 20s, ended up he was in his 30s. And they treated her like a slave, worse than a slave. Soon she had three boys, and um, she worked the fields. And again, they just treat her in such horrendous ways that um, one day she was complaining to a government official that there was someone who was a crook who was taking their share of the crops that they were uh, picking. And when he heard about Sindutai speaking up against him, he went and told his husband. And at this time, Sindutai was severely pregnant with her uh, fourth child. And he told her, he said, you know that child that's in her stomach? That child is mine. And she's been sleeping around with everyone. And if you don't get rid of her and her child, I'm going to get rid of you. And the husband freaking out, thinking that he's going to lose his life. When Sundutai comes home, he beats her to the point that he thought that she was dead. And he carried her lifeless body to the barn. So it make it appear that she was trampled by their uh, cattle. Luckily, Sundutai wasn't dead. She woke up underneath a cow who was standing guard on top of her. And if it wasn't for that cow, she would have been trampled. But at that point, she goes into labor and she delivers that child underneath that cow. And with a rock, she cuts the umbilical cord. And with any strength she had left, she crawls out of there and heads back to her parents' home. When her parents see her, they say, you've disgraced us. We want nothing to do with you. And she had nowhere to go. She went into the cemetery and she would live there and she would gra uh, gather grains of rice that people left for the uh, deceased and she would make food for her and her daughter. 
in the cemetery. One day, she thought she couldn't take it anymore. She wanted her life to end. So she took her child and they went to the train tracks and they were laying there waiting for a train to just end their life. And she heard someone screaming and moaning and she wanted to see what was going on and she saw it was an old man who was begging for food. So she begged for food on his behalf and got him something to eat and she was so exhausted that she didn't have the, the will to, to take her life anymore. And she walked out into the field and it was blazing hot. And she gets underneath a tree that just has one branch barely hanging on. And someone has hacked at this branch. And by one strand, it's providing shade to her. And she's thinking, wow, in this field, this blazing hot field, here's this tree with this one branch and this one strand that's providing me with value. It's providing me with shade. If this tree with this one branch on this one strand can provide me with shade, what is it that I can provide other people? And you would think, who could possibly have it worth, worse than her? Someone who is a, a disgraced, divorced wife with a, a child. What good, what value could she provide anyone? And she realized there were children, many, many children who were alone, who were worse off than she was living on the streets. And she started to take care of them. She started to beg for food for them and to provide them security and to provide them uh, motherly guidance. And people seeing her do this started donating to her to the point that she opened up an orphanage. To date, she's had over a thousand children that she's been the mother to. These are uh, children who were separated from their parents, uh, who had no one, only her. And you would think that that's the end of her story, but it's not. One night, Someone pounded on the door, and it was an old man who was so severely hungry. And she let the man in the house, in the orphanage, and she fed him. And then she realized who this was. This was her ex-husband. And she tells him, When I lived with you, you were rich, and I was poor. You nearly killed me. Now you're coming to me in my home, where I'm rich, and you're poor. And you're begging me for food. And he allowed him to stay there for years. But not as his hus uh, her husband. But as one of her children. Now, if this person could offer so much for so many people. What is it that we could possibly offer other people? Something as small as a smile can go so far. And it's up to us. Where is it that we prioritize? If we prioritize doing righteous deeds thinking how we can be a benefit, a value of other people, then we're going to see these opportunities everywhere. But if we're only thinking about this life and what we can provide for ourselves personally, then we're going to miss out all the real opportunities. In 2357, it reads, Surely those who are reverently conscious of their Lord and who believe in the revelations of their Lord and who never set up any idols beside their Lord, as they give their charities, their hearts are fully reverent, for they recognize they will be summoned before their Lord. They are eager to do righteous works. They compete in doing them. When our motivation is more than ourselves, we're willing to go further. When we're only in it for ourselves, it's easy to give up. But when we compete to do righteous works, to see how is it that we can benefit and help other people, we'll go much further than we could possibly have imagined. In Surah 90 verse 11, it starts, He should choose the difficult path. Which one is the difficult path? The freeing of slaves, feeding during the time of hardship, orphans who are related or the poor who is in need, and being one of those who believe and exhorting one another to be steadfast and exhorting one another to be kind. These have deserved happiness. So God willing, we can exhort one another to be superheroes, to use the blessings we have given from God at the benefit of other people, to put other people first, to do righteous works over the material possessions of this world. And if we do that, God willing, we'll live the life of a superhero. God willing, we're going to end there. If you guys got comments or questions, please hit us up at crontalk at gmail.com. And until next time, peace and God bless.